everybody. For those of you guys who don't know me, my name is Tom McGurk, and my wife Courtney and I were sent by you guys, this church, uh, three and a half years ago to help serve a sister church in Paris, France, where we've uh, been focusing on the next generation, really trying to give to uh, college students and young professionals. And we always are so excited to be with you guys. We always make a trip back to Atlanta. And unfortunately, we're just, you guys, I'm in your building, but you're not here with me, which is just super sad. But we just love you guys so, so much. We miss you guys. We think about you guys. We pray for you guys. You guys are always just on our hearts and uh, look forward to the next time we get to see each other face to face. I know we got to see each other this past summer, which was awesome. So refreshing, and I can't wait for the next time that we can do that together, uh, hopefully this next summer. Uh, my wife and I, we have two kids, uh, Mateo and Luna. My son, Mateo, he's four years old. He's at school, uh, well, he's not at school now, but uh, he goes to school in France, and so it's kind of like preschool, that type of thing. And my, my daughter, Luna, she's a year and a half, and good news, she just got her French nationality, which is pretty crazy. So actually, the next visas that we're gonna be getting are gonna be visas that basically say we're taking care of a little French girl. I send uh, greetings from the, the parish church who just really loves you guys. And we always love when you guys send your students every summer, it just always bears fruit. And it's so encouraging for us. You know, the last couple of years have been a challenge for I think many churches, most churches even. And yet through that time, God has continued to work in the parish church. And actually in the last uh, two years, we've seen uh, over 50 baptisms and restorations in the parish church. And uh, this year we had the most baptisms in the parish church and uh, as of like 20 years ago or something like that. There's still so much work to do. And uh, please be praying for us because uh, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Yeah, I'm so excited uh, about uh, the, the message I have for you today. And so if you guys can turn your Bibles, if you have them, to uh, John 15, and uh, we're going to start there. And we're just going to look at one verse real quick because I want to even help you guys, as I understand you guys are starting a fast today, which is amazing. Uh, and uh, so I wanted to share a verse that helps me when I fast. Actually, uh, my wife and I, we've kind of adopted the practice for the last couple of years to try and fast for the first three weeks of the new year. And so I'm currently, you know, seven, I think nine days into, you know, our fast. And this is one of the passages that actually really helps me as I fast. And uh, like I said, it's John 15 in verse five. It says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You know, I, like I said, I'm a parent of two kids and I know most parents, they want their kids to believe that anything is possible. You can do anything, be anything you put your mind to with enough determination, enough grit, enough just perseverance, you can, you can accomplish your wildest dreams. And what a great sentiment. And it's certainly a sentiment that the world really tries to promote. And there's some beautiful things about it. Uh, and yet, what I'm reminded of, especially when I fast, is how little I can do without God. In fact, as much as Jesus wants to do things with our lives and he wants to use us to do miracles and incredible things, uh, the Bible is clear that really without him, we can't do much of anything. We're just a branch. I'm certainly reminded of that when I fast and I'm so grateful for that priv privilege to just remember how weak I am without God and really to use that time and that energy that I have on taking care of my physical needs to really think about my spiritual needs that are far more important and far more eternal. And I'll share it a little bit more later of how my last year, uh, how my last year has been, but it really kickstarted with my fast uh, at, the, at this time last year. And uh, it really changed the trajectory of where I wanted to go. 
I really try and use this fast, as, especially with kids. Sometimes the new year, I love resolutions, although I know you can do resolutions at all different times of the year. I love the beginning of the year to, to make goals and to think about what, what is our family's vision, what's my personal dreams and desires to, to grow in my relationship with God and, and all elements, my health, all other areas of my life. And, uh, but I don't know if it's just with kids, the, the new year just flies by. January 1st comes around. My wife's birthday is Jan uh, December 31st. And so we're celebrating her birthday, New Year's, and with just the chaos of having two kids, sometimes just the resolutions escape me. And so that's why I've been so happy to have this practice of really fasting the first three weeks of the year to use that time to think about what do I want this year to look like? and to not lose that opportunity to have a new life in a new year and to really think about what I want that to look like. And so I pray that for you guys, you really use this time to really think about what do you want life after January to look like? And it actually kickstarted something that was uh, really incredible was to start thinking through something each month that I want to give up or I want to reconsider. It's actually a practice that one of your very own, Jessica Franklin, she told us about, uh, I think last year, a few years ago. And so last year we really tried to have something each year that we or each month that we were, uh, we were abstaining from. And it was just such a healthy practice and it really helped our year. And so anyways, I don't want to get too much into that, but you guys can do it. It's worth it. And uh, I'll be praying for you guys. This passage does a lot for me for, for different reasons. Actually this year, you know, with the world turning virtual and with me really feeling like I couldn't see all the people that I wanted to see face to face, I created a YouTube channel. Uh, as, some, as I shared, you know, we're in France and I'm learning French and for the last couple of years I've been preaching in French, but uh, we have a fellowship of European churches and so usually what I preach in French, I try and translate into English and I put on uh, this YouTube channel so that other people in our family of churches can hear that uh, in Europe. And then obviously we love so many of you guys and just uh, want to give whatever we can to you as we're far away. And so uh, I created that channel to, to create another way for us to stay connected. Um, and it really comes from this passage and two others uh, that uh, apart from me, I can do nothing is what Jesus says. And that's why the name of the channel is I Cannot, because really I just need to remember how much I need to stay connected to God in order for really any of this to make sense and for me to be the husband I wanna be, the father, the leader, uh, just the, the person that I, that I wanna be, the friend. And so I just, I need to remember that. And I think the, the online world can be a, a lot about putting our best foot forward. And I really wanted to create a channel that talked about how incapable and how inept I really am without God. And so that's why the channel's name is I Cannot. If you want to stay connected, know what's going on, what we're talking about in the parish church, uh, that'd be great. You, there it is if, uh, if you want the information. But uh, this passage goes on as... Jesus talks about how we can remain in him. He goes on and says a, a couple other things that I really want to share with you guys. And one of the goals that I'm developing this year that I'm really trying to articulate well and really write, just crystallize and make it more real is, uh, is I, I really just want to love people better this year. And so that's why the title that I have for you today is a simple message that comes from this passage that is just love until it hurts. And last summer, we talked about the importance of community together. I talked about how your body is not the temple, that we together form the temple of God. And Jesus here in his last moments, really, the last week with his disciples, he has a lot of things that he's trying to share with um, his, his, his 12. And uh, I love 
John 13, he taught he washes their feet and he talks about the way that they should really love one another. And he goes on and he continues that idea in uh, John 15. And in verse nine, he says, as the father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I have obeyed my father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. And so this passage, Jesus in his last days, he's talking to his disciples. He says, first of all, as the father has loved me, so I have loved you. And I think we just got to stop there for a second and ask ourselves the question, how much does God love Jesus? I mean, how much do you think he does? I mean, of course, it, it's incalculable, right? Just, unf in, I don't even know, how, is it infathomable, unfathomable? Oh my goodness, I, I should probably know that. But anyways, like this immense amount of love, and yet, okay, we can understand that. But then Jesus says, as my father has loved me, I have loved you. And I don't know if we allow that to really hit us, that Jesus, his love for us is as high and wide and deep as God's love is for, for his son, Jesus. And that's, inc that's incredible. And it's just amazing to just, it, it makes sense why we would want to remain in his love and remain attached to the vine. It makes sense to organize our life and our priorities and to fast so that we can stay connected to that love because wow, this love that God eternal has for his perfect and blameless son, Jesus, he shares that same love for us. And I know this year and every year, I'm really trying to start off the new year just thinking about how, how can I organize my life better? so that I can remain close to that love. It goes on though in this passage because then he goes to say some things that are a little bit intense. In fact, in John 14, verse 21, just a chapter beforehand, he says, whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. In verse 23 of chapter 14, he says, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. It's very similar to what we see in John 15 verse 10 that says, if you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my father's commands and remain in his love. You know, the reality is that it's impossible to separate love and obedience with God because that's really the way that God feels loved, is when we obey his commandments. You know, we talk about faith and works as if we have to choose one of them. But I think what's maybe a better choice to choose between is love and abuse. Because real love is when we, there's love coming towards us, and we love back, but abuse is when we take love without loving back. And so often we do that with God, where we want his love, we want the benefits and the blessings and the privileges that come with the relationship with him, with remaining in him, and yet we do it selfishly. And we can want that without a reciprocal type of love, a love that goes in both directions. And so instead of really faith and works, we should be thinking a lot more about love or abuse. That makes the decision a lot easier in my eyes. No, I, I just, I wanna love, I wanna love God. 
And, uh, and so this passage helps me with that. But what's interesting is he says, obey my commands. But then in verse 12, he really just focuses on one. And he says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Don't love each other by just saying, hey, love you, bro. Don't love each other by just giving nice compliments or, you know, being smiling. Or... He, he talks about imitating the love that he has for us, that God has for him with others, with each other. He's speaking to the disciples. And it's important to even remember what the you is. You know, it says, you are my friends. He's talking to y'all again. He's talking to all of you. He's saying all of us. And he says, clearly, this is a command that you cannot obey alone in your living room. Love each other as I have loved you. You cannot do that by yourself. It's communal. It's something that is done in a church family, in an assembly, and it's so essential. And he goes on to explain even more about what type of love he's looking at and looking for. He talks about greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. And the question that I really want to ask us today and it's a question that Jesus really wants us to ask ourselves, I think, in this passage. Because in verse 14, it says, you are my friends if you do what I command. And the question that I have is, 2022, are you going to be a friend of Jesus? You know, we love that song, I am a friend of God. It's a great song, and we should confidently sing that song if we understand the condition in this passage. There's a big if. Here he says, you are my friends if you do what I command. And what does he ask us to obey in this passage? What does he tell us to focus on? He says, love each other as I have loved you. He's talking about a sacrificial love. And that's why the simple message that I have for us all is this year, we've got to love until it hurts. We've got to love like Jesus loved. You know, each day I drop my son off from school and I walk by this wall. And in fact, there's a plaque there and it's in French and it's right here for you guys to see. But I'll kind of give you the rough translation of it. It's a memorial plaque. And it says, in remembrance of the children who lost their lives during World War II, when the Nazis came and took the Jewish children to, you know, to death camps to be killed, and it lists a number of several thousand or hundreds uh, that were killed in my neighborhood. And it's basically trying to just say, we're never gonna forget that under the French government's watch, these children were taken away and sent to die. And it's right on the school that my son goes to. And it's just a sobering plaque. But, you know, I live in an apartment building. The walls are very thin. French apartments are beautiful, but they are very thin. So I know every argument that's happening and I hear all the babies crying and I know what's basically going on here, here, there, it's, you know, it's just the way it is. But I just, I, the first time I read that plaque, I couldn't help but ask myself the question, what would I have done if in the middle of the night, I heard children screaming and the Nazis came in and took these children and their families away? What would I have done? You know, I like, my neighbors they're they're great we you know we're we're building friendships with many of them and trying to build connections and but i i thought to myself wow would i would i protect myself you know the south in in atlanta has a, a long history of the underground railroad and the lives that were put to at risk to save the lives of others. 
so that they could be free. And so I think when I think about that, and when I think about what Jesus is getting at here, because he's about to die, he's saying, guys, love like I do. If I have to choose between my security and loving people, I can't stop loving people if I want to be a friend of Jesus. Jesus makes it really clear in this passage. He says, you are my friends if you do what I command. And you know what my command is? Love each other like I love you. And don't get me wrong, I don't want to be careless or disrespectful, as I know we're all trying to, aren't we, figure out what we're going to do during these unique times to take care of ourselves, take care of our family, and to love God, and yet the option can never be stop loving the assembly, stop loving each other, because it really is when it comes down to what Jesus cares about the most. He wants us to love until it hurts. I want to read a couple passages that I think just should be added to the equation as we think about this year. What do I want it to look like? Philippians chapter 2, there's a man named Epaphroditus. This man who was ill and almost died trying to spread the gospel. Wow. And you would think, well, was he being wise was being careful i don't know but later on paul says honor men like him because he because he risked his life for the gospel what a what a crazy sentiment i don't know how you you how you read that passage and think through what are we supposed to do and what decisions do we all need to individually make this year in 2022 in Philippians chapter 1, Paul talks about a similar tension with his life. He says, I would rather just die now and be with Jesus. But he says in verse 22, if I am to go on living in the body, this will mean a fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. You know, this passage, Paul says, I don't know what to do, but I do know it's better to be with Jesus, but if I'm gonna be here, it's because I want fruitful labor. We have to remember the dangers of this individualistic society that we live in. You know, it's just, it's just something needs to be said about the fact that many of us in the world really hid in their homes. A lot of us and a lot of the world just fell into a Netflix, Amazon, Instacart life which is just comfort. And it's this temptation to stay comfortable. And the thing is, it stops us from loving people. It's crazy to think if you look at history, what first century Christians did during plagues. They invited the sick into their home. You look about just in the Old Testament, and where did the sick people go? They went to the temple. They went to the priests. And I don't think we should forget the fact that Jesus, he spent like a lot of time touching sick people. Now, I'm not trying to say that that's what we should all be doing is, is coughing and touching, but we've, the option can never be stop loving and not even lessen our love. Because what Jesus' standard for us is to love each other like he loves us. And that is a high calling. You know, if it wasn't our health, we could be preoccupied with many other things. Our careers, um, our personal agendas in life, 
our personal interests. And that's why Jesus over and over again talks about to be a disciple, you have to deny self. And at the end of the day, the goal of life is not a long one. If the goal of life is long, then Jesus failed, didn't he? 30 some odd years and he was gone. But when the world is living for now, because they're not really convinced in eternity or the fact that there's something better on the other side. And so, it, but us, we, instead of living for a long life, we're living for a life that lasts with legacy, a life that really makes an impact that bears fruit. And I know people are dying and I don't wanna be insensitive at all about the suffering that people are going through, but that's exactly what I'm trying to say. If people are suffering, it should be us engaging with the suffering world. It should be us engaging with our brothers and sisters who are suffering. It should be us that risk our lives, that love recklessly, that love dangerously. It should be us that shows to the world, as I'm in this lighthouse, we should be a city on a hill that cannot be hidden because we serve a friend that says the way that you are my friend is by loving one another. That type of love is scary. And that type of love creates a long lasting impact. And again, I'm, I'm not trying to say that we shouldn't be wise about the way that we live. And health is something that we should all be striving for. And there's actually many of you here that might be saying, that's, see, that's what I've been saying this whole time. This whole crisis is no big deal. And we also have to be careful in understanding, is it loving to put other people at risk? And certainly that is an element that needs to be taken into account. And I'm not at all trying to criticize even the way leaders and churches are trying to navigate this time. That is very challenging. And they're trying to make decisions for thousands or hundreds or dozens, but you have to make a decision for yourself. Because no matter how the church is organized, whether we're virtual or not, that does not absolve us from this calling from Jesus to love until it hurts, to love recklessly and to love dangerously. And some of you may feel like this is not a big deal. And are you using that liberty to serve yourself or to love people? Because the goal is not just to think, oh, my health doesn't matter. The goal is to love people more than ourselves, to lay down our life for people. You know, last year, like I shared, kicked off with a fast that really transformed the way I viewed the year. I started making decisions. Uh, you know, I had some serious lows in 2021, but I had some things that were really meaningful. I did no Netflix, no television, no movies. That was really meaningful and that helped me. Um, I was more healthy in the way that I ate. Uh, I was vegan for the year and I'm still doing that. And that's been, been great. I lost 25 pounds, that was cool. I'm stronger than I've been in probably a decade. I worked out a lot more. That was, that was awesome and that was, that was encouraging. I listened to podcasts that were, helped me, that helped me get closer to God. I read more books. It's been hard as a parent just really finding time to read. And most of these things I've had to do after 8 p.m. But I, you know, I read a lot more this year, and that was great, like 6,000 pages, I think. 4,000 in French, 2,000 in English, and that was super meaningful. And I read my Bible every day, and all those things were really, really great. And I hope to add to those disciplines this year coming, you know, that's, that's before us. But the reality is that I could do all those things. But if I don't love the assembly, 
If I don't love my brothers and sisters, if I don't love like Jesus loved, he's not going to call me his friend. I could self-improve in this health and wealth gospel that is taught around that God wants you to be wealthy and healthy. He wants you to live a long life and a rich life. No, God wants you to live a life that lasts, that endures, and he wants you to live a life of love, not trivial love, not convenient love, not self-protective love, but Jesus love, Bible love, agape love, love that lays down his life for his friends. Think about your friends. Are you laying your life down for them? Think about those in need around you in the church family. Are you engaged? Are you plugged in? This Christian walk cannot be done alone. And Jesus knows that we do better when we think less about ourselves and think more about loving others. As you begin this fast, I really pray that you guys talk amongst each other and with God on your knees about how can I love more deeply this year? How can I love more recklessly, more dangerously, more like Jesus? And guys, if you know the upside down production of the book of Acts, Abby, she would say, don't you dare even give a thought of saving me today. It's not about my life here. I'm already saved. And for that gift, there's no price I won't pay. And I love that song because it talks so much about this idea that, you know what? I'm going to live for the next life. And every day that I have on this earth is another opportunity for me to spread the love of Jesus. This love that Jesus received from his father. And he loves us that same way with the same measure. I'm going to spread that type of love. So church, I want to encourage you, make some decisions to love until it hurts. And I can't wait to see you guys soon. Love you guys.